recording. And um, I wish you a very happy and hopefully you enjoy our webinar. And with this, I will give it to our first speaker, Gina Fernandez. All right. Can you see my shared screen, everybody? Yes. Or Mark? Okay, yes. good deal. Okay, so I'm going to give a very brief overview of what we've done in 2020 and then a little bit about what we're going to be doing in 2021. Um, just an overview of the breeding program. Again, want to uh, remind everybody that it's, it's an ongoing process, multiple stages, and each one of these stages goes on each year. So the first stage of a breeding program, we have seedlings there from the crosses that we make. Um, each year we put out thousands of plants. Uh, the second stage is the selection stage where one to 2% of, of the plants from the seedling stage actually make it to the next stage. Um, we have about hundreds of those. And then the third stage of the breeding program is we have replicated and on-farm trials. And those are where the best selections from the previous stage are put into replicated trials and we compare them to standard cultivars and we have like tens of them. So you can see how this is sort of a pyramid in reverse where we start with a lot of plants and we narrow it down over time. And each year we have the same cycle going on. So we're doing all these three stages at the same time. Uh, this year what we had, we had about 5,000 seedlings at Castle Hain, our Central Crops Research Station and at Castle Hain. Um, we, and then thank you to Bill Klein who actually helped evaluate some of those because uh, we were not allowed to travel at that time. Um, so they looked at some down at Castle Hain as well. We look at um, disease resistance down there in particular. Um, this next stage is the selections and we did all that work at the Central Crops Research Station in um, Clayton. We had about 29 selections that we evaluated in 2020 and those are about 10 to 20 plot plants or, sec or 10 to 20 plant plots um, that we evaluate and we take a lot of data on them. And then we have about 200 others in the nursery that we just keep around for um, crossing and other things. And then the, the, the other trial we had is a cultivar trial. We had at both Clayton and at the Piedmont Research Station in Salisbury, we were only able to harvest the whole thing in uh, at the Piedmont Research Station. I'll share that data with you. But um, I did evaluate all the material at Clayton. They only allowed me to go out there at the first uh, part of the season. So um, that's why we don't have the full replicated data on that one. So these are just a look at the seedlings, what the seedling field looks like. So each one of those plants is a distinctly different plant, just like you know your kids would be in, in a family. Um, so we look at these plants once to twice a week because you know some things come on earlier or later. We make notes with, or we put flags on plants that we like and we kind of keep an eye on that one, say this one looked good this week, maybe it has disease resistance or maybe it has large fruit. We go back a second time and put wooden stakes um, on, next to that if we continue to like it with some of the traits we like. Um, the traits would be, it could be either a plant that has um, commercial potential, like it could be the next cultivar, but we also want to build up our, our parents. So we want to have something that maybe if it has really good disease resistance, we would select it as well. And that's called a selection. So it goes from a seedling to a selection. Um, out of these 5,000 plants, we select maybe 2% of them. Um, and so this past year, we had 120 new selections out of this field. These are the selections that we made in 2019. You look at that little number down there, that means North Carolina, we made it in 2019, and this is a 15th plant. We barcode everything too, so we can kind of do um, fancier data collection. Um, so once they get into that field, Rocco helps me propagate that, that, original, that original one plant, goes up to 10 to 20 plants. We look at plant vigor, the appearance, the capsize, the firmness, et cetera. Um, we look to see, we score for diseases. It doesn't have one, then how bad are they? We take lots of pictures of them. And then this year, we usually do some lab analysis, but I took them back to my garage. I'll show you what we did there. We set up a little lab in my garage and we did the, and I did the berry weights with my kids. We did bricks, sugar levels, and then evaluate a whole bunch of other horticultural traits that breeders collect, that kind of data like color, seed location, uh, shape, et cetera. And then we saved berries and we sent them down to Kannapolis. So Penny Perkins Easy will be doing some more chemistries on them to see um, what we have with those different selections, about 29 of them. 
can also do a lot of evaluations in the field with a little iPad or with a little um, tablet. We then get, again do some of the same type of things where we look at the uh, vigor and location of flowers, trust site, we do yield estimates. So we really take a lot of data, spend a lot of time looking at the plants um, each year and seeing uh, you know, what kind of traits they have. And after a couple of years, you really get to know, oh, that 15 looks really nice. So um, that's basically what uh, we, I, especially me, spend a lot of time doing. This is the, what we looked, the setup in the lab looked like. I would harvest the berries in the field by myself, bring them back to my garage, my lab, and my daughter helped me take the data. So we did 25 berry weight. Um, did the bricks, we did the appearance, we did a lot of taste tests too with my family. And I think they got to appreciate um, the flavor differences that we found in these different berries. Some of them they, uh, they really liked and some of them they didn't really like. So it's really interesting. My husband is a breeder also, so he was pretty tough on them. <clears throat> and uh, we found a few that we liked out of the, the whole collection there. This is just what it looked like there. I had both my computer and my tablet taking a lot of data. We'd slice through them, look at the internal color um, and weigh the berries. And this is just wanna show you some of the, the selections that we looked at this year. So these are all NC19 selections. So this is NC19 017, 018, 21, 22. So you can kind of see that there's differences in sizes and shapes. Um, what kind of stood out for us last year was this 22 and 23 down here. Um, and uh, I think in the next slide too, we'll see another one too that was, next slide. Um, oh, I don't see it here, 19-015. Uh, so there's a lot of different, and um, we'll take, we'll be looking at these guys again this year just to see um, how well they perform. You never wanna go on one year's data. In fact, you wanna go on many, many years data. So of these, we're hoping to put several of these, I think there were, we evaluated 29 of these different um, NC numbered ones. We're gonna put them into a replicated, about nine of them into a replicated trial next year and, and uh, see what uh, kind of numbers they come up with next year. Then hopefully after that, we'll be able to say, okay, you know, let's start looking at these two or three. We'll narrow it down to maybe two or three really closely. Here's some uh, more of the different selections. So we made a couple in 19, or 2018 as well. And then we did look at a couple of New Jersey selections. Here's one of them right here. Um, they have great flavor, but they just don't look pretty in our locations. And we do have a lot of um, cultivars in there as well. So we always wanna have something to compare it to. So we have Chandler in there. We had Brilliance from Florida. Of course, Rocco and Liz were there. Kalinda from European Breeding Program and uh, Camarosa, Sweet Charlie and Ruby June. I think there's actually a couple others, but just wanted to show you a snapshot of what we took there. Um, Here's what they look like in the field too. So this is Rocco here on the left, Kalinda here on the right. We have plots, whole plots of each one of these. This is Ruby June and Liz. Um, we do have a lot of data on those. And this is some of the yield data we have on each one of those and just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Rocco did really well for us. Pretty similar yield to Chandler last year. Um, really high marketable yield. Uh, Camino Real does pretty good for us as well. Um, very big berry size in Camino, just really nice berry size, but it is a firm one with just okay flavor. Um, what else down here? Oh, oh, we did two things. This was at the Piedmont Research Station too. We planted Rocco on time and then three weeks later, and you don't wanna plant Rocco or Liz three weeks later. We found that the yields went <clears throat> really far or really dropped. So they really need to get that um, we late September planting date in that region. So that's something we learned this year. Ruby June, um, plants health was a little bit um, iffy this year. Really nice flavor though, really pretty looking berry. Uh, we'll be looking at that one again. Um, and then these two New Jersey ones that just taste okay, but not really great um, appearance. So just want to give a, and a quick, really quick brief overview of what the breeding program has done since I took over. We've had on-farm trials of both Rockwell and Liz in six states, um, including uh, seven uh, locations in North Carolina. We've increased the number of seedlings that are evaluate, evaluated each year from a couple of hundred to 5,000 last year. So we have um, uh, been, become more efficient in that. We've made at the beginning only a couple of selections each year and, and we made 100, over 100 actually last year. Uh, we did release Rocco and Liz. Those are patent pending um, and available from a couple of nurseries. 
We screened a good portion of our germplasm for both anthracnose, crown rot, and, and um, fruit rot. Uh, we've developed and screened mapping populations. That's you know using some fancy genomic um, study or tools that we've identified QTLs, which are like markers for both fruit rot and crown rot. And we're starting to, to develop those into tools so we can screen in the future our germplasm. We've established an in vitro system. What we found when I took over this program that it's really hard to keep plants clean in the nursery. So everything that we get in our breeding program, we're putting a backup into um, a tissue culture system. We have a really great student working with us doing all that. And she's probably a baby about the quarter way through that, that um, procedure. We actually had to go all the way up to the chancellor to get her allowed to work on campus during this whole COVID thing. So it was, it was quite um, a struggle to get that done, but uh, uh, Randy approved it at that level. Um, and we fingerprinted all our germplasm so we know exactly, we can identify it. If there's a, a nursery mix up, um, we can um, be able to use our, our tools there to identify it correctly. Um, we had a PhD student now, he's a postdoc memo, he's really a, a great asset to the program. And we've had five undergraduates and interns trained and we actually just brought in a new master's student Katie um, Sheehan Lust, and she will be working um, with both a raspberry and a uh, re uh, strawberry project. Uh, she came from Cal Poly, where she worked with Kelly Ivers and, and um, Gerald Holmes in their strawberry program, too. So I'm excited to have her join us and, and do some fun stuff. So that's pretty much it. Um, just want to thank everybody that's working with us and the, the work that they've done. We'll be doing the same thing next year. Hopefully we'll be getting a few more cultivars in the trial um, with uh, we'll sign some paper worth last and Canyon. We'll have some of those um, and continue. Rock was putting together that list this week and he's, I think in the mountains somewhere gathering up some plants. So we'll have a better idea what's going on in the trials in a couple of weeks. So that's it now. I actually have to run to another meeting um, if anybody has any questions, you can send me an email or Mark can relay that question to me later. Or if anybody wants a quick question, I can answer it now, I guess. All right, thanks, Gina. I don't see any questions in the chat box. So. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Go ahead. Yep. All right, thank you very much, Gina. And um, our next speaker is uh, Hannah Burrock, and she will talk about insects. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get my slides going. And while those are loading, if you guys have any specific questions um, that you would like me to address, you can feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat box while I'm getting my slides up. As they are slowly loading. can see something. All right, yeah, it's, it's getting there. <laughs> yep. All right, let's start that over, see if that'll work. All right, try one more time. Best laid plans of virtual meetings, right? You get your slides all open and then they don't want to show. So PowerPoint is opening really slowly for me. Again, Mark, it went ahead and shut down. Um, so if there's any questions for Gina or any of the other panelists, folks can also type those in the chat box. Do, do you want to work on that? And I just have Bill going first. Is that okay? 
Um, Bill, if you're ready, it's, it's open now. Let me see if I can get it open um, up and presenting for you. Here we go. All right, should be good to go now. Okay. All right, folks. Yep, we can see it. Here we go. All right, so um, I'm going to be focusing on three main topics. Um, talk first about some of our pest management considerations. I'm going to go through these slides relatively quickly, and I'm really just hitting the high points of both pest management and pollinator biology in strawberries. Um, and I'm going to focus my comments on pest management around pre-plant, post-plant, and springtime considerations with a real emphasis on what to think about this time of year. So the things you want to be focused on from a pre a pre-plant pest management program is you want to be really focused on transplant quality. So look for your look on your transplants for pests. If you need to communicate with your nursery about what you find and what management implications that has, we will go through that. What those management implications might be in the next couple slides. Post-plant, you should be scouting those transplants on a weekly basis, at least through the end of November when things get cold or when you put your covers on. And then in the springtime, you want to resume weekly scouting once your temperatures exceed 50 degrees Fahrenheit and continue that through the end of harvest. So this should be your general pest management strategy in terms of monitoring. And what we're really looking for at those key time points in the year is often going to be two spotted spider mites. This is our key year in year out strawberry pest in North Carolina. You want to focus on looking for these guys using a minimum of a 10x hand lens. And for your transplants, you want to observe at least 10% of the plants that you're looking at and evenly distribute those throughout the flats that you have, assuming that these are plug plants that have some foliage on them. And this is what you're going to see when you observe those plants. You're going to see in some cases adult mites if they're present. You can see these nymphs, full nymphs, as well as eggs. And I'm going to you also want to note if there's any aphids present or any deformed new growth on those plants, which can be a potential sign of cyclamen mites. Um, and so you want to pay attention to that in the future. And I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the biology of spider mites. This isn't something I talk about every year, but I think this is an important piece of information for growers to understand, to really wrap their brain around um, a management strategy for these important pests. And so I'm going to walk you through their life cycle and what implications that has in terms of management. Um, so here's your adult female. She's larger than the males. She is rounded on the rear end. Um, and so the, there was a question in the chat box about 50 degrees Fahrenheit at air temp or at plant level, that's air temp. Um, so that's your, your temp at which spider mites begin developing. And we base that on air temperature. We don't worry about having temperature probes in the plant. So your adult females are larger than the males. They're rounded on the rear end. The males are going to be smaller. To me, they look almost crab-like and they're going to have a pointed rear end. Um, so if those guys sexually reproduce, then you end up with both sexes. And a newly hatched larva is going to have six legs. They'll be very small, similar in size to an egg. So here's an egg here. Here's a newly hatched larva. And if you squint real close, you can actually see the two little red eyeballs inside this egg where it's going to hatch. These eggs are about half the size as this adult female's abdomen, so they are very large. When you watch this female laying an egg, it's a whole process. Um, they have a complex life cycle, so they go through two stages that we call a protonymph and a deuteronymph stage. In both of those stages, they are immobile for some period of time. So you see these kind of cloudy looking protonymphs here. They're inside a semi-chrysalis, their last um, exoskeleton before they've molted, and they're not mobile. And so these are stages that we're not really getting a whole lot of control with any of our mitocides because they're not moving around and they're not feeding. Then there's a mobile nymph stage between those two immobile nymph stages. And then our last immobile nymph stage, the deuteronymph stage, the females will actually be guarded by any males that are present. And so this is a male who's patiently waiting for this female to emerge as an adult, so then they can mate and the process can begin again. This entire process under optimal conditions will take about eight days, seven to eight days, and optimal conditions are about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, or up to 40 days at cooler temperatures. And so that process 
of development begins to start at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's when we begin to have risk of reproducing populations. And so we can have some reproduction over the winter, and we do see this every winter where we have populations that continue to develop during the winter. We don't have much of our population that goes into hibernation or diapause in insect speak of spider mites in North Carolina. They are typically feeding and slowly developing most of the winter here. So if you find mites in the fall on your transplants, what should you do? You should treat them. Bringing mites into your field on plants is a bad idea. So you wanna clean those plants up as much as possible. So if you look at them after you receive them from the nursery, or if you have a population develop early in the fall post-transplant period, you wanna treat. So if you're a conventional grower, here are our miticide options. I'm listing the trade name, the IRAC, mode of action group. This stands for Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. This is a number that is given to different modes of action to allow you to rotate effectively between them because the same chemical can have the same mode of action and therefore have concerns for development of resistance. If we treat mite populations in particular with the same chemistry over and over again, the propensity to develop resistance is pretty great. Um, they've developed, spider mites have developed resistance to many different chemicals and they can develop that very quickly because of that rapid life cycle. These miticides target different life stages. So you can see some of them target the mobile life stages, those nymphs and adults that are moving around. Some of them target immature, so eggs and the nymphs that are not moving around or are not reproductively mature. Some have activity against multiple life stages and some just against a single life stage. And then I have our efficacy rating here. So if you have a population of spider mites that develops in the fall, following transplant or come in on your plants from a nursery, you want to avoid using the miticides that are listed here in red. And that's because these are acceptable for use in greenhouse or strawberry nurseries, meaning they're not precluded from use in those environments. And it's possible that applications of those materials may have been made on your plants prior to you receiving them. You can either avoid the use of those chemistries or you can communicate with your, your plant supplier to determine what might have been used on the plants that you receive. But you do have a number of materials which cannot be used in strawberry nurseries or greenhouses that have reasonable efficacy against spider mites. And so I would instead lean on those chemistries during the fall period if you need to treat. I'm also highlighting two materials here with asterisks next to them that are in our category that we might want to avoid for fall treatments. Um, but in the spring, we might be considering using these materials. Um, but these are popu uh, materials for which we have known possible resistance or lack of efficacy um, in some southeastern strawberries. So these are materials you want to be a little bit cautious with regardless. Some other best practices for two-spotted spider mites, you always want to avoid pyrethroid applications in the fall or spring when your mites are present and this figure illustrates why that is. Um, this is a, an experiment that we did in one of our research plots where we had to manually infest our spider mite populations because we didn't have anything and we needed to do some efficacy work. It took about a month for those populations to start developing to the size that we could do our efficacy work and apply our pet target pesticides. And that's our blue line here, the date we applied our target pesticides. And what you can see is this purple line just dramatically increases following that pesticide application. And that's our brigade treatment. That is the treatment um, using a pyrethroid insecticide on a miticide population. And that's what will happen if you use pyrethroids when mites are present. You will flare those mites. Um, don't worry about all the efficacy uh, data over here. That's a whole bunch of spaghetti. Um, but what I really want to point out is that pyrethroids should not be your material of choice if you have mites present. You should rotate to something else. If you need to treat for a different target pest with a pyrethroid and you have mites out there, you want to be sure to take care of the mites first or consider doing something with a tank mix for an actual miticide. Your spring treatment threshold for two-spotted spider mite remains three mites per leaflet based on your spring scouting. 
Biological control can be a very effective tool to use against spider mites in either conventional organ or organic production. Um, but particularly in the fall, this time of year, uh, if you have a spider mite population that develops, biocontrol is going to be less like to, likely to suppress that population. And that's because our biological control agents are going to slow down their development, similar to how our spider mites slow down development in cooler temperatures. And so they're not going to be as active. They're not going to be feeding as aggressively. And so if you do happen to bring in some dirty plants from a nursery, using a miticide is probably going to give you better control in the fall than trying to do a predatory mite release. Um, in the springtime, predators can be really effective, again, going out there once those temperatures start to exceed 50 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so let's move on to talk about uh, spotted winter sample a little bit. Um, in general, we don't worry too much about spotted winter softball in our spring fruiting strawberries. And that's because in most years, they are ripening and harvested during a period when our spotted winter softball populations are lower. That's not the case for some of our other host crops, but our spring fruiting strawberries usually escape significant injury due to spotted wing. If you shift your strawberry window into the fall and you are trying to produce on day neutral plants, then that's a whole other ball game. Um, then you are growing a higher risk crop in a higher risk period for spotted wing damage. But for our more traditional strawberry season, it's generally not a major concern. So in most years, we can manage whatever infestation develops in our strawberries using cultural tactics. Um, just to either uh, pop in the chat box if you happen to see these articles this year anywhere um, or were aware of this um, small viral controversy that happened in May. Um, so this was uh, a series of videos that some users posted on TikTok illustrating um, what happened to strawberries that they soaked in a saltwater solution. So those of you who have heard me talk about spotted winter softball before know that that's actually a sampling technique we recommend growers use in order to determine whether or not they might have fruit infestation in a range of host crops with spotted wing. Um, somehow this ended up in a couple viral TikTok videos. It was picked up by a couple BuzzFeed articles shown there on the left. And then um, I spoke with this reporter from Lifehacker um, to kind of contextualize this a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and see if I've got the, um, when I'm done presenting, I'm going to go ahead and put the link to that article in the chat box and you can uh, check out that article as well. Um, but there are potential post-harvest concern. I got a lot of questions about whether there were bugs in strawberries this spring. And in order to minimize the risk of there being larvae present uh, post-harvest, there's a couple cultural tactics that strawberry growers should be sure to maximize. The first is frequent thorough harvest. And so this is data from raspberries, but it holds true for strawberries as well. Um, Heather Leach, when she was at Michigan State University, did a study looking at harvest frequency in raspberries and found that when you picked every day or every two days, very thoroughly, you would de significantly decrease the number of eggs, small larvae, and large larvae that were present in that fruit. The harvest frequency, in other words, reducing the amount of time that fruit are exposed to egg-laying flies can significantly reduce the potential for infestation. The other thing you can do is keep your fruit cold. So post-harvest cold storage also reduces infestation. And this is work that was done by my grad student, Laura Kraft, where she looked at holding strawberries among other spotted wind drosophila infested hosts at either zero degrees Celsius, which is um, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, or 34 degrees Fahrenheit, 2.2 degrees Celsius for three, four, or five days. All of those durations significantly reduced the amount of larvae that were present in those fruit as compared to fruit that were held at room temperature. And this was consistent across all of the life stages when she did experiments focusing just on eggs, so newly hatched larvae, middle, middle sized larvae, or large larvae. Again, we had that significant reduction. The newly hatched larvae were the least, uh, were the um, most tolerant of cold temperatures, but again, we had significant mortality when held at three, four, or five days, in this case, at zero degrees Fahrenheit, or zero degrees Celsius, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So the last thing I want to just touch on very briefly 
is an overview of some work that we did on strawberry pollination biology. This is a two-year experiment at 22 locations in North and South Carolina conducted by my grad student, Jeremy Sloan. And he identified a number of different pollinators present in strawberries, notably honeybees, wild bees from 12 different genera, so a fair degree of diversity, but very widespread kind of diffuse diversity, as well as flies. And an interesting observation he made was that flies were present earlier in the growing season and bees were present later in the growing season. And so here are some, what some of those flies look like. So here are our honeybees, our wild bees, and then our bees that mimic, or flies that mimic bees, and some of our other fly species. But interestingly, what he saw was that there was a lot of variability between pollinator numbers shown down here grouped together by honeybees, native bees, and flies, and strawberry quality, in this case is measured by weight. And that there wasn't a good correlation between the number of pollinators we were seeing, for example, at this location where there were no bees whatsoever, and strawberry weight. Location 13 had comparable weight to location 16, for example, that had high overall abundance of pollinators. And this was similar in 2018 as well. So again, there's that same location 13 where we had very few insects and no bees at all as compared to location 21, which had high diversity in a number of different insects. And in this case, we had numerically higher weights at location 13 than we did at location 21. He did see a relationship between increasing numbers of pesticide applications, and in this case, mostly fungicides, and decreasing pollinator bee specifically abundance, um, but he saw more pollinators present on conventional than he saw on organic farms. And he saw that there was a greater, there was a greater positive effect on berry symmetry in larger agricultural land than in areas, strawberry farms that were surrounded by more natural areas. And so what we think is we're seeing that production practices are mattering more in this system and pollinator abundance is. And so pesticides, mostly fungicide applications, could negatively impact pollinators in strawberries, but those pollinators are not directly benefiting strawberry weight or symmetry in our observations. And so again, our, the strawberries that we grow and the way we grow them seem pretty resilient to limited pollination. Um, so therefore, those pesticide impacts on pollinators may be more important for other crops within a given farm. And unless you really need to increase pollinators on your farm by stocking honeybees for some other reason, it's not going to provide you a measurable benefit for your strawberries. So that's probably not something you need to be concerned about doing in, in an individual farm from a yield perspective. Um, that's all I had to cover. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and answer any questions briefly that you guys have. All right, I don't think we have a lot of time for questions right now, so I, I would just move on to Bill and give Bill the opportunity to talk. Okay, thanks Mark. I'll, I'll uh, see if I can, uh, can share screen now. Okay, I appreciate this opportunity to uh, to speak, and can you hear me okay, Mark? Yes, sir. Okay, so um, let's see. I go to a little bit fuller screen there. So, uh, really going to focus um, on the pre-plant and fall considerations rather than the uh, the total package of strawberry disease control. So, looking mostly at um, at uh, pre-plant considerations in, in the fall of the year. So just an overview, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, pre-plant and the strategies for di avoiding diseases, uh, fumigant and weather effects uh, at planting time. Uh, with, these are, are um, something that I've observed in multiple years. And uh, also uh, I'd like to finish up by talking about strawberry crown diseases, because those are the disease problems that we tend to encounter in the fall of the year. It's not so much uh, on the upper parts of the plant, but actually uh, crown diseases uh, that often kill the, uh, the plant itself. I'd like to, uh, to start off just by making sure everyone knows that we do have the uh, regional strawberry integrated pest management guide. So pretty much uh, everything that we say, uh, we try to capture 
in this uh, regional guide that's updated every year. Just, just updated this one again as a group, but the new version's not online yet. So you'll still see, I think, the, the uh, 2020 guide. Uh, but the, uh, the changes for 2021 will show up in 2021 and, and should be there in January yet. But uh, this is the website for, for that, smallfruits.org and the uh, strawberry IPM guide uh, in PDF form. And this is a, uh, a cut and paste from one of the tables in that guide. Uh, as, the, uh, it's a, as the guide begins, one of the things that we start to focus on is uh, pre-plant uh, disease nematode and, and weed management. And just wanted to, uh, to share this because these are the things that uh, should be on your mind uh, pre-plant uh, as far as pests, uh, uh, anthracnose, angular leaf spot, uh, Phytophthora crown rot, uh, Fusarium viruses, all these uh, diseases that we're worried about at, at the time of uh, pre-plant right now are best managed with the use of disease-free plants. So you see the uh, the top line in the column. That's your that's your activity for managing those pests, and it works really well. If you have disease-free plants, you tend they tend not to get the disease during the course of the season. Um, so so this is the the upfront. Uh, uh, decision that growers should be making now is where are my plants coming from? How do I make sure that I have uh, clean plants? What's, uh, what's my nursery source uh, going to be? And uh, that, that would, should be your, your primary concern at this point. Um, the next line you see, uh, nematodes. Uh, if you're planting back into a field that you've had nematode problems in in the past or just planting back into a field year after year, I strongly encourage you to sample the field uh, for nematode analysis. Uh, nematodes are an insidious pest. You don't see the, the pest, but you do see a gradual decline in the plants over time and stunting. And so you need to know if they're there. So if it's a field you use a lot, I, I test for nematodes. Uh, one way to avoid problems with nematodes and also any uh, soil-borne pathogens is, uh, is practicing crop rotation. So I really want to think about where your strawberries were in previous years, where you'd like to plant them in the coming year if possible, move around so that you're not planting back in the same spot year after year. I know that's a, that's a difficult to impossible thing for, uh, for some folks, but it is a, a disease management strategy that, that should be uh, in your mind. Also, uh, just mentioned a little bit about um, uh, weeds and root and crown rot disorders. Uh, these uh, diseases uh, tend to be more of a, a more of a matted row problem uh, where, where you have uh, strawberry plants that persist year after year. Uh, not so much with, um, with the uh, annual hill culture system that we mostly talk about, but the, uh, the management procedure uh, for those is the pre-plant fumigation and, and plastic mulch. And that's our, our uh, black uh, plastic culture system that we use in North Carolina that uh, most of you are, are utilizing. And again, uh, fumigation and plastic mulch and an annual system uh, excludes a lot of these pest problems that we used to have uh, back when we grew a lot of matted rose strawberry. I wanted to show this uh, picture. This is from December of uh, 2018 because when we talk about fumigation, we also have to consider the, uh, the adverse effects of, of the fumigants. Uh, when I first uh, worked in strawberries, we um, we had uh, methyl bromide with 98, 98.2, 98% methyl bromide, a very effective fumigant, a, a very volatile fumigant that, that disappeared quickly. Uh, the fumigants we have today compared to methyl bromide are much more persistent in the soil. And so really have to consider uh, if you fumigate under your plastic, how soon uh, you can replant or, or plant back into that, uh, that fumigated bed and really have to consider um, that these fumigants dissipate slowly. If it's a wet year, wet soil, um, and you, you punch the holes, you really need to give, give the, uh, the fumigant time to dissipate uh, before you plant back. So uh, the, the really uh, short plant back times, uh, you can run into problems. If you're smelling fumigant, if you're, uh, if you're working the ends of the rows and, and uh, working your drainage in the field and you're still smelling fumigant, you really need to wait uh, for your planting date. And that, that pushes everything back. It pushes back the fumigation date. It pushes, uh, pushes out your, your plant back date, but 
uh, you really can uh, get uh, a fair amount of stunting just from the uh, from the fumigants. And also uh, the, the cool wet weather itself will contribute to that to that problem. So seeing seeing more of this, and I think it's a concern. We look at the uh, currently registered fumigants. Now this this table is from the North Carolina Agricultural Chemicals Manual. Uh, you, uh, you see a, a lot of, uh, of the uh, telone type products, uh, very often mixed with chloropicrin. Lots of um, lots of options there. So the the one one three dichloropropane mixed with the chloropicrin or tear gas uh, type material um, is, uh, is is really the uh, the most commonly used option. Uh, you see names like Picclor and so forth. Uh, another product that I've used in the past. Uh, reasonably good success is the uh, uh, metam sodium. I don't know if anyone's used the old uh, Vapam product. Uh, uh, it's not the best, but it is, uh, it is an option that's uh, fairly good for, for uh, diseases and for, uh, and for weeds. So uh, you may opt as a grower not to fumigate at all. If, you, if you're in a site where uh, weed pressure is low and you, you know you don't have a lot of nematode or disease problems, I know a lot of plastic gets laid without fumigation, but uh, the options have changed from what they were many years ago, and the, the fumigants are, uh, uh, it's a little more complicated and, and a little more likely to uh, persist longer than you want them to. The diseases that we're, uh, we're going to see in the fall of the year uh, are crown rots, and I'd like to, uh, to switch gears now and just show some pictures of uh, the crown rot diseases we're likely to see in the fall of the year. This is anthracnose crown rot, uh, you can see on the, uh, on the left there, the symptoms inside the crown. Uh, what I'd like you to look for in your uh, nursery plants, if you're buying uh, plug plants from a, from a nursery, when I inspect a tray of plants, I'm looking for these uh, small circular spots that uh, don't go all the way through the leaf. Uh, they, they're almost like little shadow spots, uh, almost perfectly round, uh, smaller than BB size. So, so uh, very distinctive spots, and these are, are an indicator of uh, the anthracnose crown rot pathogen. Uh, so this is a telltale sign of, of a problem in the plants. Uh, if you do uh, have plants uh, that you've purchased that you're getting ready to put in the ground and you see the uh, small circular spots on the leaves, uh, that would be a, a time to consider uh, a dip treatment for the plants. Uh, the, the product I see used most often is, is uh, Switch, which is a combination uh, fungicide product, two different fungicides uh, that has some efficacy uh, at, at this stage. This is some more shots there of anthracnose crown rot. This is uh, shots both uh, spring and fall. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll see uh, stunting of the plants, uh, very often a rapid wilt, uh, rapid decline with anthracnose crown rot and the, uh, and the characteristic uh, appearance of the, uh, of the crown. Just uh, another shot, uh, various stages of anthracnose crown rot. Again, the, the uh, small round spots on the leaves of the transplants. Uh, sometimes in a, in a uh, transplant bed uh, of trays, you'll see it run through the, through the trays and uh, really cause a lot of plant death before they ever leave the nursery. So managing this uh, disease uh, is a matter of using disease-free plants. Uh, resistance is generally not available. There are a few cultivars out and now some of the newer ones that have, uh, have some resistance to the fruit rot stages uh, uh, and, and to crown rot, but, but nothing that I would call completely resistant. So uh, disease-free plants is your first move. Uh, you want to monitor the fields and remove any infected plants. And again, if, if, you, if you fear that you've gotten plants that are infected uh, uh, before, you, before you plant them, uh, switch is a, is a plant dip, the ciprotonil plus uh, flutioxanil. Uh, combination product. Uh, you have to plant immediately after you dip them to avoid uh, stunting on the plants. Uh, so, so they dip and then just immediately, immediately plant back. Uh, there is another product that uh, we may have in the future. Uh, it's uh, called Zivion. The active ingredient is natamycin. Uh, really uh, have had a lot of back and forth uh, this month with, uh, with other pathologists trying to figure out where it's labeled, and uh, we do have a label in North Carolina, but uh, not sure how available this product is. It's just gotten just gotten labeled, but there's some good data out of California indicating that this is uh, a worthwhile uh, treatment 
uh, for plants that may be infected. So uh, Zibion, if not this season, then in the future, uh, we'll have the uh, we'll have the product. Again, we have the label, but no data from North Carolina, and and not sure if the product is is going to be readily available. Uh, another uh, crown disease that we're going to uh, talk about briefly is the uh, Phytophthora root rot, and you see symptoms like this in the field, and uh, very similar to uh, to what you see with anthracnose crown rot. Maybe a little more survival of the plant as uh, stunted the small leaves in the center of the crown, but really hard to tell those two diseases apart uh, in the field. Uh, so uh, it's really important to to make that determination because the fungicides, the products that you use to control these diseases are different. So if you um, if you suspect you have uh, Phytophthora root rot, I would say send a sample to the plant disease and insect clinic. There, there are some characteristic symptoms of the disease. Uh, again, the, the stunting along with wilting, a little less rapid decline than with anthracnose. The crown symptoms are, are different. This, this sort of chocolate brown spot in the crown rather than the marbling. But uh, again, I, I'm, I'm more comfortable with a, with a laboratory test uh, to confirm before you treat. Uh, another shot of the same same type symptom again looks a little different from the uh, anthracnose crown rot, and a few more shots of the same thing. Again, these are these are uh, symptoms that are are at times difficult to distinguish uh, from anthracnose. Uh, what I do typically in, in in my lab at Castle Hain, if I get a sample that I think is uh, Phytophthora crown rot, is I'll look in the roots under the microscope just crush some roots uh, between the slide and the cover slip and, and look at them under the, under the microscope and you can see, um, you can see old spores, these, these round structures here uh, inside the root. This is a microscopic uh, image of the uh, uh, strawberry root pressed down against the slide. So uh, that's another way to tell uh, uh, besides the uh, PCR type uh, tests. As far as managing Phytophthora, again, it's a clean plant. Uh, site selection and prep, You're, you want to avoid poorly drained soils. Uh, so uh, uh, the better sites you have, the less of this you'll see or the less of you'll have uh, persist. Uh, irrigation, uh, this is a waterborne pathogen that can spread plant to plant. And the uh, chemical treatment is uh, quite different from anthracnose, uh, uh, methanoxam or ritamil, or, or some of the various uh, metal axle treatments uh, can be applied in the fall and again in, in the spring. So just to summarize the pre-plant disease uh, control strategies, uh, avoidance by using clean plants, uh, a good, a well-drained site, uh, avoiding sites with a history of disease. If you think you do have a problem, uh, let's get it diagnosed. Let's make sure we know what you've got. And that tells us what our course of action is as far as treating. So really want to base the, the treatment on, on a correct diagnosis of what pathogen problem you have. Okay, I think that's all I've got, and uh, I'll hold questions, Mark, unless you want me to take them now. Right, thanks. Uh, yeah, I just want to say we're running about 10 to 15 minutes late. Um, so what we're going to do, we're trying to answer a lot of the questions already online. If you put them into the question answer box, and we will address all questions at the end of the seminar. Um, there was one question, there's one hand raised, so if, uh, that's, I think it's Ellie. If Ellie wants to um, put her question into the chat box, that's, that would be great. And now we're moving on to Katie uh, Jennings and her presentation. And then Mr. Burries, Greg Burries, I hope I pronounced it right. I, we don't understand your question correctly. If you could ask that question uh, again, and give us a little bit more information what you mean with proper way of trip irrigation and how long. Are you talking about trip fumigation or are you talking about trip irrigation? That is something which we need to know. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, you're, you're, you're yeah. I think, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. Let me just get this on. Okay. Good evening. I'm happy to be here today and I'm going to talk to you about uh, weed control and strawberry. And I'd like to just begin um, and tell you a little bit. Some of you may already be. Let me get the video. Sorry, I didn't realize I didn't have the video on. Okay, there we go. Um, 
Some of you may already be familiar with the My IPM app. Um, we recently received a grant where um, for us to collect some uh, photos, take some photos and put together some um, weed ID information and weed um, control information into the My IPM app. So I just want you to be looking for that um, in the near future. And we've started with strawberries. So that will be um, the first bit of information that we will actually put up there. Goodness, now I'm having issues with the, there we go. Something else I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is just some research that we're also doing in our program. Um, Kira Smith, one of our graduate students, is looking at Embed Extra, um, which is a herbicide um, that is potentially going to be registered for um, row middles in strawberries, uh, in plastic culture strawberries. Some of the weeds that you would see some good control of um, are some weeds that we tend to see in strawberries, including vetch, cut leaf evening primrose, clovers, docks, Carolina geranium, um, and, and chickweed to name you know, a few of the weeds. So also we expect that it would provide uh, good control of those weeds in the row middles without injuring the ryegrass. A lot of the herbicides or several of the herbicides that we do have available to control weeds in the row middles will actually um, injure your ryegrass. For example, we have paraquat and glyphosate. Um, both of those would, would burn back the ryegrass. And also some of the pre-emergence herbicides that are registered um, will also uh, prevent germination of the ryegrass or or um, suppress it so it, it, it doesn't get a good start. So with this particular herbicide, you would be able to control some of those broadleaf weeds in your row middle without injuring um, the ryegrass. And so the research that Kira was doing, she's looking at the effect of embed herbicide on the strawberry growth, the fruit yield, and the fruit quality. And so why are we looking at embed? Well, it's, it's a 2,4-D formulation. And as you know, some of the older formulations were prone to drift. Um, well, if they did drift, there would be, you know, potentially severe injury on uh, horticulture crops, including strawberry. Um, and they were, uh, they really were susceptible or prone to, to volatilize, so kind of lift off and move. So with this particular formulation, um, there's really near zero volatility. So we were hoping that we would then be able to use it in a horticulture crop like strawberry without um, having any injury in the strawberries. And so this uh, visual here just is showing you the different formulations of 2,4-D that have been registered or on the market over the years. And the ester formulation um, over on the left hand side of the graph, that's the formulation that historically, you know, has been very volatile and the one where you would hear a lot of um, off target movement and, and, and injury in horticultural type crops. So the Embed is a choline formulation, which is over there on the right, and the um, injury um, in various research uh, studies has been very low. And of course, it has that, would provide excellent weed control. And in her uh, particular research, uh, she's seen less than 5% injury on the strawberry foliage, um, no effect on the plant growth or fruit yield, and no effect on the quality of the fruit. She measured pH, bricks, and titratable acidity. So now let's move on and just talk a little bit about some, an update on, on some weeds. And this, these are some photos that were taken, um, not this, obviously not this year, but they were taken um, soon after planting about two years ago. And I, want, I just want you to see the weeds that we're seeing in the strawberries were actually some summer annuals. And these photos were all taken in about, no, about November. Um, and so this is that you can see we have some pigweed species here. We're seeing, we actually saw Palmer amaranth here, which is a, a, a big problem in, in summer, uh, summer crops. 
of purse lane, which is also a summer annual. Um, and then we're also seeing here a, a tumble pigweed. This is what's all down these, these row middles. And we're also, we also saw some of it coming out of the holes there. So it just wants you to be aware that we are seeing more summer annuals um, surviving in uh, the plastic culture. You know, that's a perfect environment. You know, the temperature, it's a little bit warmer in there. Things are protected. So it's important to make sure that you're doing some scouting, which I know I'm sure all of you do a really good job at your scouting and removing the weeds. Um, and especially prior to putting down any sort of row covers. You know, you wanna get these little tiny weeds out before you um, heat up that system and make, you know, an even better environment for them to, uh, to grow. That, I just mentioned that, so we'll skip over this. Uh, another area to, that you need to focus on um, is to control your weeds around your fields, you know, even you know after harvest along your field edges because these are these weeds will be good sources of uh, weed seed that can cause problems you know next year and, and many years after so it's a good idea to to control your weeds especially before they produce seeds so when we talk about herbicides that are registered for strawberry use um, the crop safety or, or crop tolerance can be dependent on the timing of the herbicide application. So, you know, can we apply this herbicide as a, as a pre-plant application or post-plant or if it, if it does, can be applied post, does it have to be applied directed just to the row middles and not contact the strawberry plant? So those are things you have to kind of make sure you're reading the label. Um, there's also the pre-harvest interval uh, limitations, you know, how many days do you have to wait before you can harvest the fruit? Um, and like several of the speakers have already mentioned, um, it's important to begin, you know, with healthy strawberry plants. Um, you know, you want to have those strawberry plants to grow off as well as they can so they can be competitive with any weeds that might come up through the strawberry holes. But you also want them to be healthy because um, over the years, sometimes what we'll see is if, if we, if you know, in our research plots, if we don't start off with the best strawberry plants, you know, we may see some herbicide injury that we maybe wouldn't normally see if we had good healthy plants. You know, you want your plants to be good and healthy. So if you do have to use herbicides, you know, they, they were, they're still gonna grow off well. So our recommended program, and I'm not sure that a lot of you are doing this, but I would suggest that you do, is that you put down a herbicide uh, before you plant your strawberries. So after you make your bed, it's a good idea to use a, a pre-plant herbicide. Because as you'll notice, as I go through a lot of these slides, um, the upcoming slides, there is not, there are not a lot of herbicides that are registered for post-emergence application. So if you don't control the weeds prior to germination, then you're gonna have to hand remove them most likely. Um, Stinger is, about the only post-emergence herbicide that you have available to you to control broadleaf weeds in the bed over top of the strawberries. Stinger controls uh, a very narrow spectrum of weeds. Uh, it does control them very well, but it does not control a lot of different broadleaf weeds. So it, that's important there. It's important then for you to be able to identify your weeds correctly so that you can you know, make sure that uh, you're not just throwing your money away and applying something that's not gonna control the weed that you have. Fortunately, we have you know, several different grass herbicides available. Um, and then for those row middles, we have the contact herbicides such as Paraquat, AIM, uh, that you can use, but of course you are gonna also burn back your ryegrass. Um, and I'll just briefly mention with Paraquat, there are some new uh, training requirements uh, and new certification that's required um, for users. Um, so it used to be that uh, if you had somebody working for you, they could apply Paraquat underneath your license. 
but now they have to have their own license as well. So um, you need to make sure you know, that you're following those new requirements for Paraquat and, and there are some um, safety trainings available. Um, also, I don't have Roundup mentioned here, but you could use Roundup in your row middles, but when the strawberries are very young, they're very susceptible to off-target, um, from injury from off-target movement. Um, as they age, they become more tolerant, so I'd be more comfortable with you using uh, Roundup, you know, uh, later in the season, you know, after January or something, you know, not, not uh, in the fall of the year when they would be uh, less, uh, less tolerant. If now if we'll go ahead and just move into some weed identification and some um, herbicide recommendations. If you look at this, this is yellow and purple nut sedge, which are weeds that you might see in the beginning of the season soon after planting. Um, because, you know, it's, it is warm and, and, and they do germinate uh, in this time of year. They can germinate within four days of laying that plastic. You can see um, the leaves puncturing through the plastic. So what we have to control them as far as herbicides are Spartan. Um, it's a, and it needs to be applied pre-plant. And the rate is four to eight ounces. And it is dependent on the soil type that you have. So most of the soils, if they're sandier soils, you're gonna use that four ounce rate. And as you get to the heavier type soils, you would use a higher rate. And it is better on the yellow nut sedge than purple. Fortunately, most of what we have in North Carolina is yellow nut sedge, which is the, the leaf on the left and the of course, the way to tell those two apart is that yellow nut sedge is, it comes to a much finer point than the purple nut sedge. Henbit is a winter annual. It, start, it will germinate uh, in the fall of the year. Um, in order to control it, there are, you do need a soil applied herbicide. So again, a pre-plant herbicide. And we have three of those options, Chateau, Spartan or Goal, and there are no post-emergence options available. Um, Goal has a 30-day plant back interval. Spartan does not have a plant back interval, and, and Chateau also has the 30-day plant back. The picture on the bottom there of the strawberries, that's actually Chateau applied post over top of the strawberries. So that, I just throw that in there just to kind of show you what that injury is, but you definitely just, you don't want to put that as a post-emergence. You could use Chateau also in your row middles, um, which would control a lot of these weeds, but I know with ryegrass, it's, it's definitely going to inhibit germination. So if you're using ryegrass, you definitely do not want to use Chateau in your row middles. For uh, common and mousy or chickweed, uh, the difference between those two is mouse deer chickweed has a, a lot of hair on the leaves, and that's that lower um, picture on the left-hand side. The smooth-leaved is the common chickweed, which is the one on the top. Again, Chateau, Spartan, and Devernal would control this, uh, both of these weeds, and again, no post-emergence options available. Carolina geranium, Goal, will control this as well as Spartan. Vetch, this is one of the weeds that Stinger will control. The rate for the bed top is uh, a third to a half a pint. A third of a pint is usually all you need. And you this um, does require you to um, sign a, a waiver of liability. So you need to go, um, you need to get the special label and, and sign off on that in order to apply Stinger. Um, if you wanted to apply Stinger in your row middles, you can go a little bit higher on that rate and go up to like two thirds of a pint. But again, with Vetch, it really uh, controls it well at the lower rates. One thing to remember when you're applying it over top of your strawberries, which you can do safely, but you do not want to tank mix it with um, any sort of uh, other pesticide like insecticides or fungicides, and you do not want to add an adjuvant because these uh, things can make it potentially hot 
or you know and, and potentially injured the strawberries so only use stinger by itself for cut leaf evening primrose uh, goal and chateau will work and again there are no post emergence options curly dock Goal is about the only thing as far as um, a pre-plant option. And if you remember back in the beginning when I was talking about the embed, the 2,4-D uh, formulation, the new formulation, that will control it. And so we're hoping that we will get that registration for row middles. Uh, Stinger also actually can be used post-emergence for curly dock. It has to be relatively small. So, you know, somewhere be between this size here on the left and probably not quite as big as this, you know, on the right, definitely a little bit smaller. Um, here, what I'm showing you here, this is called an okria. This is uh, like a paper sheath type uh, material that actually surrounds the stem and uh, the petiole of the leaf. So that's a way to identify weeds that are in this particular family. Corn spurry, although not highly competitive, um, I do see this sometimes um, in strawberry fields. Uh, you do have an option. Gold would do a, a partial control, um, Chateau and Spartan. And if, if you did need to hand remove this, this is actually an easy weed to hand remove because it has a really shallow root system. Um, we, for row, let's switch gears and just talk a little bit about row middle weed management. Um, you know, I know often you have to kind of dig down. If you have a really good stand of ryegrass, that's, that's good because it'll be more competitive with those broadleaf weeds. Um, but so sometimes you might have to dig down. But if you do see some things like this, you know, you have those options I mentioned before as far as AIM, uh, Paraquat, or uh, Roundup, just know that you may want to, you need to decide, are you going to do a spot treatment, you know, and, and realize you're going to kill some of that ryegrass, or do you want to do a broadcast application and, and kill all of the ryegrass? So, um, again, just some things you need to keep in mind. I think in, in light of the time, I'm going to go ahead and skip the slide and just leave you with this, with some resources um, that you can access. If you, uh, Bill's already mentioned, I think where to get the guide and um, I have some photos of uh, herbicide injury and things on the Wolfpack weeds. I use the Virginia Tech Weed ID site um, quite often. I'm sorry, that's the phone. Let me just get that off here. All righty, with that, um, I'm not sure we have time for questions, but if you want to put them in the chat box, maybe I could try and answer them for you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katie. And uh, I just wanted to say that all the presentations will be online on the Strawberry Portal in about 24 to 48 hours from now, including the rec recording of this session. So we are running uh, about 15 minutes late, so I'm just gonna jump directly to my, to my presentation. And um, please add your uh, questions into the chat box or into the Q&A, and we will have a few minutes later to answer the, the, um, the questions as well. So, I just want to go with you guys quick about um, about uh, normal general strawberry pre-plant considerations for annual hill plastic culture. So we're not going to address any um, matted row systems here. I know there are a few matted row growers still here, but we, start, we will talk strictly about annual hill um, plastic culture. Um, and then I've put it into like three different sections. We will talk a few, a little bit about the cost, just to give you a refresher, then soil prep, which should be mostly done by today. Um, and then fertilization, and then we go about fumigation and bedding. So um, basically the steps which you have to do until you transplant your plants. Um, uh, so, and costs, we usually look at five to seven thousand dollars per acre in an annual hill plastic culture system, which makes it significantly more expensive than a matted row system. 
Um, and in total, we look at twelve to fifteen thousand dollars of per acre of production costs. But we are only going to talk about the establishment part today, so basically the pre-plant plant part today. Um, a a uh, annual hill plastic culture system can generate some income. It depends a lot on your planting space, on the weather, on the row spacing. We we see a lot of rain lately in in the North Carolina. That that uh, can have a huge impact on your yield on the cultivar you're growing, um, and also on the price which you get for your strawberries per quart. Um, again, if you're a first time grower or even a second time grower, don't expect that you uh, go into a strawberry season and you can make money. You often uh, put your feet into some pitfalls, even with all the pre-plant um, meetings which we have. Um, but a good pre-plant management system and a good a uh, strawberry plant to begin with sets you up for success. If you do not have good planting material, and I think it was said a couple of times today, and as well as if you don't have a good pre-plant management to begin with, that will not set you up for success. So those are really the basics which we're talking about here today. Um, and then of course it comes to like um, uh, 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 frost management and, and later uh, disease management in your field. Uh, over the picking season, but those we're not going to talk about this today. Um, so establishment costs, if we lo uh, look it up, the main costs are plants really, and again it depends a lot on your planting space, and when we're talking about plug plants, we're looking usually at about three to four thousand dollars per acre for planting material, and then fumigant is probably the next cost which is relatively expensive, depends a lot on the fumigant, but between six hundred and a thousand dollars per acre you can uh, 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 account for the fumigant if you want to do it on your own. If you find a custom fumigator, those are usually run between $2,500 and $3,000 per acre. If you do it on your own, it's, it's a little bit cheaper, but you do have uh, still to buy the plastic, the drip tape. You have to buy lime, which I hope you already have incorporated by now. You have to get your fertilizer, uh, lay flat connectors and all the other stuff and of course you have to have a fumigation rig or somebody can borrow, lend you a fumigation rig and then of course you have to put in the labor to do it as well. So we're looking at total and this is just the back of the envelope kind of I kind of a calculation about between five and seven thousand dollars per acre which does not include the fencing um, which you often need especially in smaller patches here in North Carolina. Um, so the pre-plant cycle is just a part of the whole strawberry cycle. So what we're talking about today is how to select the site, so the right, correct way of soil sampling and soil preparation. Then we do talk about pre-plant fertilization, soil fumigation, plastic mulch, and transplanting, and all that in 10 minutes. So we better hurry up. Um, so site location is very important that you have some wind breaks, but not too many because later you get a lot of humidity in the summer. So you do want to have some wind flow, airflow in your site. Um, but in the cold, in, in the in the springtime, in the wintertime, in the north northwest of the field, if you have some wind breaks there, that would help with your cold protection. Um, again, if you do a pick your own or you pick, you want to be have good visibility. That's probably number one. And then also you need to be close to a water source because you need to irrigate and you also need to have water available for potential frost protection in spring. Um, row orientation, again, in the western part, uh, uh, air drainage might be very important. Water drainage is usually the most important part to think about. And then if possible, rows should be located in the north-south direction. Um, slopes, usually if you're in the western part, uh, south facing facing means you have early fruit development, but that also means you need to get earlier to your frost protection. If you're north, if you're north facing, that means you have late fruit development, which also gives you the opportunity to do not, not not to do frost protect that early. Um, but that is basically for Piedmont and especially for the mountains the case. Um, also, site selection is important and wildlife can be a large pro problem, especially deer. Uh, they love to eat small strawberry plants, um, but also we have problems with raccoons and other things which steal stuff. So a fence is usually necessary. Um, so you want to have to calculate in your costs, basically a fence if you need one. Um, and this is more for the mountainous region. 
Um, in hilly regions, you often have problem with airflow, um, and you see that you want to put your strawberries into like a, a, a region where we, which we call thermal, thermal belt. We do not have a lot of cold air standing in the field. Erosion is often a big problem in hilly regions. Irrigation uh, can be a problem if you have to irrigate uphills and not downhills. And then you can, can also lead to washed out beds. So basically what we usually recommend if you are in a hilly region, try to find a, a, a flat ground or something which has only a three, four percent slope that would be the best way um, in, in the mountains in the Piedmont region. Uh, soil type, uh, plastic, annual plastic culture allows you to, to use uh, also clay soil, but still sandy loam or clay loam um, are most preferable. Um, if you have too much sand or too much clay, or if you have rocks in it, that will, uh, that will, hinder, you, that will hinder your bed formation. Um, and you need to be able to form a six to eight inch high bed for strawberry production. Soil sampling, again, that needs to, should be done by now. Um, usually we try to sample six to four months before planting. And I stole this figure from another presentation, um, but I really like it because it shows you how to sample. Um, so basically what you wanna do is if you have three different areas with three different soil types, for example, in your field, you want to sample randomly at different spots in six to eight inches depth and uh, combine those samples and send those to the North Carolina Department of Agriculture for um, your um, analysis. And that would show you A, how much fertilizer you're going to have to apply, and B, and that's the more important part, do you have to apply lime to uh, adjust your pH to a range between six and 6.5. Um, Usually we try to plow our soil between three to six months prior uh, planting, which uh, you know, helps you to decrease the residues which you have in there from last year. Uh, and also you should want to remove deb debris and trash and uh, try to work your soil at least eight inches deep and also remove all the rocks before you, if you have rocks before you start planting the strawberries. Um, again, that will help you later with uh, a bed formation quite a bit. Um, so if we talk about fertilization, apply fertilizer shortly before bed formation and uh, try to work with the soil test recommendations. As a rule of thumb, you want to apply, apply about half of the nitrogen, which, is, which we say it's about 60 pounds per acre of nitrogen before as a pre-plant, you want to uh, apply uh, all of the phosphorus, which is 120 pounds, and then about the same amount of potassium um, in your soil. And then if you have boron deficiency, you might want to add boron. If your sulfur index is low, you might want to add sulfur. Again, there are recommendations out there on the this link, which, is, uh, which are, which are uh, written in 2015 by the um, North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And I'm going to put that link later into the chat box for everybody to look at those recommendations. Um, Fumigation and bedding. Um, planting space is uh, based a lot on the variety and also on the vigor of the plant. And uh, often in North Carolina, we use a 14 inch planting space for things like Camarosa, for example, or Chandler. Um, smaller cultivars like Merced, for example, could go on a 12 inch planting space. Or if you're on a colder site and you know you're not that vigorous, you can plant other cultivars on a 12 inch as well. But for usually for, for the Chandler Camarosa or Ruby June or on any of the other cultivars, a 14 inch a planting space in most of locations is what we recommend. That gives you about 15,000 plants per acre um, if uh, in, in, the, in the annual plastic culture system. So fumigation and bedding, and uh, we usually look at six to eight inch high beds. Um, we usually look at 60 inch centers and about 30 to 32 inch uh, uh, top of the beds, bed tops. And, um, and usually that gives you about, with a 60 inch center, it gives you about 8,712 linear feet of plastic. And uh, we use, uh, you, you want to use a 64 to 66 inch plastic roll for that and make sure that the beds have a minimum of six inches high if, if possible. Better would be eight. Um, we do have a question in the chat box. Um, 
Oh, okay, this is just a number. All right, so um, plastic is very important for fumigant. If you fumigate, plastic is one of the, is a very important piece because it seals your fumigate in the ground. Um, again, PE films are very cheap, but they also don't have a very high uh, co uh, control efficiency, they, which means they load a lot of the fumigants out very, very quickly, while uh, virtually impermeable film or totally impermeable films are what we call VIF or TIF. They're more costly, a little thicker. So VIF has three layers and TIF has five layers. Um, they have a better control efficiency for certain fumigants, especially for 1,3-D, which is part of most of the fumigants which we're using if we're not using um, methyl potassium or methyl sodium, like Bill uh, uh, said earlier. Um, uh, important factors that affect fumigation is our soil temperature, soil structure, soil moisture, uh, the plastic and the ceiling, and of course also the application rate. Um, you have to make a fumigation plan anyway, so try to put in some effort into that. That really helps to get you get your things right. Um, usually, we want to have at least a soil temperature above 50 uh, degrees Fahrenheit if we want to have an efficient soil fumigant application. Again, that depends a little bit on the chemical which we apply. Um, so you're going to have to look that up on your um, uh, uh, data sheet. And then soil structure. Uh, sandy soils are usually uh, uh, help to dissipate, to, to let a fumigant dissipate. If you have too many thick clots in your soil or if you have a high organic matter that can decrease your fumigant efficiency. Um, soil moisture, you want to be pretty right with your soil moisture. If, you have too, if you're too wet, your fumigant will not dissipate in, in, your, in your soil. And if you do not have enough soil water content in your soil, your fumigant also won't be able to dissipate. So usually fumigants, most fumigants look at about 70% of field capacity, which means, for example, if we have a heavy rainstorm or like a hurricane coming through, you do not want to fumigate right away after that. You do want to wait until your soil is a little bit drier. Um, and then very important, don't save on your fumigant. If you apply not with the recommended rates, but lower rates, you will not see the efficiency. And in the worst case scenario, you will, you will select for, for certain pathogens which do survive those uh, fumigation rates. So usually uh, for Piclor 60, we look at 350 to 400 pounds per acre. Uh, that equals about 170 to 200 pounds per total acre area. We, we're talking about the plight area here. Um, so please look at your label and go with the recommended rates and talk to like your fumigate applicators um, to look what your rates are. Again, don't save on your fumigant. It will not give you any uh, good results. Uh, so common fumigants are Piclor 60 and 80. Uh, those are two chemicals, chlorpicrin and uh, 1,3-D. Um, and also telone, which is a lower amount of chlorpicrin and a higher amount of 1,3-D, at least telone tel 31 is. We have a full telone product, which only is 1,3-D. Um, and then paladine is another one, which is a very efficient fumigant, which is on a, a dimethyl day sulfate basis. And then methyl sodium, methyl potassium products like WAPEM, KPEM, and Sectagon are again um, efficient fumigants and are being used more and more in our region as well. Um, just to show you the difference between, so those are fumigants combined with, with different plastics. And I don't want to go over this whole uh, uh, table, just to show you that Telon C35, which is 35% chlorpicrin and the rest is 1,3-D, combined with the T, uh, TIF or VIF plus, uh, uh, pl uh, plastic has a much higher control on weeds, for example, you can see here clearly than the Telon C35 combined with a normal polyethylene plastic which has almost no control on these. Um, so, and then at last but not least, if you're looking at fumigants, uh, please use uh, uh, PPE, personal protection equipment. Do a fit test, get your medical exam, make sure that everything on your mask forms a seal. Store and try. Store all your, all your uh, respirators at a cool and a dry place, so not in the garage or not in the shop or not in the truck or not in the tractor, and clean it regularly and change your cartridge regularly. So before you go fumigating this year, if you haven't fumigated for a year, please buy new cartridges and get them on 
so that you're safe. Um, don't use a cartridge that has expired. You're going to have to throw that away and get a new cartridge. Um, that is from my side, and uh, I hope we have some time for questions. There were some which I would like to address, uh, if the panelists still have like five minutes. Um, let me see. So, Hannah did head out, so I don't see we have any questions left. There was one question uh, which I wanted to address in person, so I'm going to do that and then that's it. And that would be um, uh, sharing my calendar with you guys. That was not the plan. Um, and that was uh, um, the question which Minda had. She wanted to know um, if there's Antrichmus Cromwell, if uh, some of the nurseries have patches that don't appear, if they affect the sellable um, uh, uh, plants. And Bill did write a really good quest, uh, answer here. It depends on the level of disease in the nursery. Plants can be affected without visible symptoms, and that's basically what I said too. And nurseries can pull suspect trays and reevaluate the remaining plants over time. Uh, but the fungus can, so anthracnos can splash about six feet and can also be moved around the hands and clothing as people move through the nursery. Okay, so if there are no other questions, please put in your numbers, your pesticide numbers into the um, chat box. Do not put your pesticide numbers into the Q&A box if possible. And Matthew is taking the numbers and then I hope you guys had a good webinar and uh, that was it from our side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.